Ah, it's an 87th Precinct podcast. This is the only podcast in the world dedicated to Ed McBain's seminal series of police procedural novels, which began in 1956 with Cop Hater and ended in 2005 with Fiddlers. There were 55 books in the series, and today's podcast looks at book number 32, Long Time No See. To review the book, I'm joined by two visions from the world of dreams. <laughs> Mr. Morgan, going to school in his pyjamas, Brown. Hello there. And Mr. Stephen, going to school in the nude, Royston. Yeah, hello. My name is Paul Abbott, and last night I had the strangest dream I ever dreamed before. I dreamed the world had all agreed to put an end to war. I dreamed I saw a mighty room. The room was filled with men, and the paper they were signing said they'd never fight again. And then I woke up. <laughs> a little bit of a protest song yeah, thing there. Yeah. lovely. So enough of that bit of nonsense. <laughs> the bit about dreams will make sense as we go along. Anyway, the reason I'm saying that. Indeed. Remember, everyone, you can visit us at Twitter, Facebook and Instagram by searching for Hark87 Podcast. You can also email us at hark87podcast at gmail.com. No one ever does. So it'd be nice if you did. And if you want to help us out, then please leave a review on whatever podcast app you use, but especially Apple Podcasts, because that helps us to reach more people. We're back, and it's 2020. It is. Happy New Year, everyone. It's still still January, so we can say that technically, I think, anyway. Yeah, it's fine. Isn't this one of the years that everyone was going to be flying around in flying cars? Yeah, 2020 does feel fairly futuristic, doesn't it? Um, You know... That, that kind of tubes up to the moon. Food in pill yeah. format. That, yes. That, that kind of... All that stuff, yeah. I always thought that was supposed to happen by now. Yeah, early days, yeah. Probably well, by March or so. Yeah, yeah. We'll everyone's, got, everyone's got to get back to work after the Christmas yeah. holidays and sort all this stuff out, haven't they? Yeah. Fair yeah. enough. And well, you know, I'm quite looking forward to that. That'll be good, won't it, when yeah. we're... Um, and you can just hologram over here or whatever. Yeah. Or <laughs> transport magically. Star Trek style. Yeah, so it may be 2020 now, but we're going to be looking at a book from 1977, which is the 32nd of 55 books. We are, we're getting on with it. Astonishing, isn't it, really? Yeah, we won't be far off in getting into the 80s soon. 32. So, Blimey. What I'll do is I will give you a little bit of a Ed McBain background, what else was going on in the period since the last book. 1977 sees only three short stories published by Ed McBain or Evan Hunter or whatever name he was using. One is called Sebastian the Cat, and that's in Playboy, so I suspect it is not just about a happy-go-lucky cat. Mm. (laughs) Nice name for a cat, isn't it, Sebastian? It is. Lovely. In June 1977, he published something called Codename Petals, and that was in... (laughs) (laughs) Talk about a cat as well. (laughs) Yeah. But that was in Woman's Own Weekly. In three okay. consecutive issues. So I'm not sure if that's an extract from a, a different book, but mm. yeah. Codename Petals ended up in Woman's Own Weekly. Sebastian the Cat in Playboy. Lucky he didn't send them off to the wrong, <laughs> <laughs> the wrong publishers. And in November 1977, there was a, in Rogner's magazine in Germany. Rogner's? Rogner's. And I'll try and get this pronunciation right. Kurzgeschichte. That sounds about right. Kurzgeschichte. It's otherwise known as short, short story in its English hmm. title. Wo ist das? Kurzgeschichte. Yeah, Kaiser like that. Petals. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that sounds about right. Kaiser Petals. <laughs> so that was only three short stories. As by this point, he's only doing the occasional one that turns up in Playboy or something like that. Not like 20 years before when he was just doing hundreds and yeah. hundreds of them. But 1977 does see the publication of Goldilocks, which is the first book in the... Matthew Hope series, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. of which I've not read any of those. No, I've got a big pile of them and read none of them. Yeah, I've got a couple um, awaiting perusal, but... Yeah. I think it's supposed to be all right, though, because he did persevere with them for quite a while, didn't he? He did. I think he ran out of steam with them eventually, because I think he... Much of the, as the reason the 87th Precinct series is good is because police are supposed to be investigating mm. crimes. He got to a point a bit... With Matthew Hope, I think where he's going, like, well, a, a lawyer wouldn't be doing this. I can I, I can only think of so many excuses to get a lawyer into investigating this crime when he shouldn't be. Uh, yeah, I think he kind of alludes to that issue in the the foreword to the latter latter day editions of um, Cop Hater, doesn't he? Yeah, basically, I think so. Yeah. But 
the Goldilocks, uh, the Goldilocks, the Matthew Hope books, starting with Goldilocks, are set in Florida, and essentially Matthew Hope lives in the place that McBain was living at the time, because <laughs> him and his then wife Mary Van had moved down to Florida, in fact, to Lido Shores, Sarasota, Florida, and that's essentially where he sets the Matthew Hope mm. uh, books. Right. I'm led to believe. So he must have been a bit like Quincy, sticking his nose in where <laughs> yeah, exactly. he's had no jurisdiction. <laughs> Basically. It, it, yeah, most non-cop-based crime things, if you think about it, would actually be over in five minutes when the first policeman that the mystery author or coroner or huh. whoever it is turned up would go, no, you shouldn't be here, <laughs> and you being here is going to really mess things up. Yeah, I think that's quite in quite a lot of the series you read, like the uh, the whole basis of whether any good is how not trying to get that to be contrived, you know, yeah. the ability of the author yeah. to make it. Obviously, nine out of ten involve law enforcement people, but I'm I'm sure McBain will do a pretty good job of handling that. But still, it's it's got to be tricky to do it over and over again for a whole series. Yeah, like the Travis, Travis Travis McGee, John D. McDonald's are quite good, and they have this fairly preposterous <laughs> concept of a guy who salvages anything, doesn't he? Like mm. lost yeah. fortunes or people or whatever, which is a bit daft, but it's still quite a good ruse yeah. for getting him in various in places he shouldn't be. Scrapes, yeah. Yeah, you can you can do it if you set up the right situation and your readers expect a certain, yeah. you know, yeah. you'll you'll let them off with yeah. it basically. So. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, but I should just mention that although uh, I did say that Evan Hunter, Mary Van, and her daughter Amanda Finley were living in Florida, they were also living there with their cat, who was called Higgins. <laughs> Higgins. Is, better, is that a better name than Sebastian? I think Higgins uh, is a better name like. for a cat. Yeah. I, I think it would very much depend on the character of, of the cat, wouldn't it? Yeah. Big snooker fan named after Alex Higgins. <laughs> or the butler from Magnum P.I. Was he called Higgins? That was oh, Higgins, wasn't it? I think so, yeah. yeah. No idea. I think it definitely was. <laughs> so I'm just imagining a cat with a big round face and a little moustache. So, Which was really good at snooker. <laughs> yeah. It's all the various Higgins roll into really one. Really bad-tempered snooker player. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine that's he's named it because he's been watching watching British sport. It, mind you, nineteen seventy seven, this I haven't actually got this noted down, but nineteen seventy seven was basically when Snooker first started being broadcast. It was the year it started at the Crucible. Yeah, so it went to the it's Crucible. It's all aligning, isn't it? Yeah, there we go. Higgins was more significant than we thought. In the archive of Evan Hunter, you'll like this. There's a one entry outside of a load of letters and correspondence from nineteen seventy seven that's listed. And it's a bit of his research. It's a copy of a book, or, well, some pages from a book. And the book is called A Collector's Guide to Pressing Irons and Trivets. <laughs> oh, okay. So that's, what, that he wrote? No, no, it's just something <laughs> he's been using for research. Oh, right. <laughs> so I'm not sure what book it's for. Possibly he was writing about the, the book Lizzie, I think, at the time, about Lizzie Borden. So it might be ah, about right. domestic things from then. I don't know. Yeah, not just a... a, a thriller set in the exciting word of vintage trivets <laughs> yeah basically <laughs> no film or tv directly linked to McBain that year in 1977 but there is 1977 is the year that Incar comes out which is the bollywood adaptation of high and low mm. which is the adaptation of king's ransom oh, yeah. which i covered on the podcast with lorraine a couple of yeah. years ago as well even that that, that premiered in India on the 18th of November 1977 Fantastic. and I suspect he went his entire life and never heard about it once <laughs> Probably. right so I would think that's caught up with McBain's time yeah there. Well, although one thing reasonably busy between the last book and the book we've done what we're doing now is he released a book called Guns a standalone McBain which I recently read and I believe Morgan has not recently read <laughs> many many years ago and I've never read is it set in Isola no, it's 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 not even in the world. Oh, it's, set, right. it's set in New York. Right. But you'd be forgiven for picking it up off a shelf. And I probably bought this thinking, oh, this is an 87th Precinct book. Because the edition I've got is, and you as well, is... The exact same thing, yeah. Goldstrike McBain. What do you remember of your feelings about it, Morgan? Um, I'm sure I really enjoyed it at the time. I can remember very little about it, really. It's just 
Can I have a read of the back of it? Yeah, absolutely. He follows a kind of gang member in sort of 70s, like, grubby New York. Yeah. Well, he loves his gangs, doesn't he? Yeah. I'm, I'm reaching the point where, having read uh, Long Time No See, he's obsessed with gangs. I think there is a period where the gangs thing crops up too much. Mm. But it may actually be, it's not that often, it's just every other book or something like that. Mm. There's something about it. And I, I remember when I was first reading the 87th Precinct books, going, oh, not another gangs one. Mm. But, you know, he was also writing about doing research for gangs for a standalone book called Walk Proud, which became a film. Oh, right. So... Gangs were very much on his mind almost yes. all the time, anyway. Yeah. But yeah, Guns is an interesting one. I'm not sure it's brilliant. It's a basically a man-on-the-run book mm. about a, a heist that goes wrong. In some ways, do you know what it reminded you of? I said, I, I said to you two guys, I'd started reading The Onion Field yeah. by Joseph Wamba, and I had to stop because it was way, way too depressing to be reading in the run-up to Christmas. Yeah, it's not very festive. But the way that sets up the characters, their relationships, their times in prison, mm. this is he's sort of done a mini version of that in Guns, mm. very similar of having the, the relationship patterns and prison patterns of the members of the heist squad, you know, that are knocking over shops to make money. Mm. So it's quite, I think that was in the air as well, possibly. Mm. And, and, but then it basically ends up all going wrong and, and Colly Donato is on the run. But what is interesting about this... <laughs> In fact, you know, I'm going to hold some of that in reserve and try and remember to mention it at an appropriate <laughs> point in, when we're talking about long time no see. Anyway, it's all right. Yeah. I miss it not be, you know, it could have been an 87th Precinct one told from the perspective of a, of the baddie. Yeah, which which can be interesting as we've, as yeah. we've seen, just kind of setting things in that world, but approaching them from a slightly different angle. But I will also say the 87th Precinct books, it's, they're not exactly hard hitting, but they don't pretend to be not realistic. There's swearing, there's violence, mm. there's sex. In these standalone ones, there's more swearing, there's more violence, there's more sex, there's more discussion of race, mm. there's more use of racial epithets, which I'm sure were realistic to the world he's trying to write about. But it is it is noticeably like a mm. notch higher than in the 87th Precinct, I think. Mm. And he wrote that onto McBain. As yeah, McBain. as a McBain book, because it's a, it's a crime book set in New York. Which is McBain rather than Hunter. Morgan just hit his microphone stand. I'm very sorry, everyone. I will discipline I him later. I Start again. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. Podcast ah. cancelled. <laughs> okay. Right. Quickly before we get stuck into the book, then 1977. Oh, right. Who was the Prime Minister? Callahan. It was yes. Callahan. Who was the President in America? Uh, that for, was. Uh, oh, no. Was would it, it be Carter Jim, by then? Yeah. yeah. Ford outgoing, Carter yeah. incoming. Anything else from 1977 you'd like to proffer up that you know about it? Being two years before you guys were born, a year before I was born. God, we're almost overlapping with our actual any... lives. Good Lord. Yeah. What happened in 1977? I reckon some motorway was open somewhere. No. Some <laughs> bri- well, probably. Some great bridge. What you were supposed to do is wave a tiny Union Jack. Oh, A bit oh, like course. Nigel Who's Farage the, yeah. today. Because it's um, yeah, Silver Jubilee. Jubilee. Indeed, Indeed. Indeed. God save the Queen and all that. Etc. Yeah. Lots of mugs and knickknacks. Yeah, still seeing like little antique shops. Yeah, the very well, young looking yeah. queen. Well, younger looking well, indeed. queen. So it was still the jubilee year for Queen Elizabeth II. She toured around the Commonwealth basically that year. Yeah, good on her. Yeah, indeed. So there you go. Getting pestered by the Sex Pistols and and all that. Well, <laughs> did she ever listen to that song? I bet she must have done. <laughs> Give us a you're potted a, history a, of what the Sex Pistols did in 1977, reckon? Morgan. Um, kept signing to record labels and then getting dropped before they managed to release a, a record, Most mostly EMI and A&M, and then finally landing with Virgin. I guess by that point they'd already booted Glenn Matlock out of the band, who was the competent bass player and one of the main songwriters, and got Sid Vicious in, who wasn't competent but had very spiky hair. Yeah, um, essential. And then, yeah, I guess they'd be releasing a little string of classic singles and recording Nevermind the Bollocks. And then shortly after that, they'd be, if come 1978, they'd be zipping off to America to implode. Yeah, So a uh, bit, bit of a brief um, but bright burning kind of yes. uh, run there for them. Oh, they're attempting to play and failing to play because they were banned everywhere, so they had to tour as spots. No, right. Sex, pist- Sex Pistols on tour secretly. 
Oh, yeah, well, that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> good, good punk update. Thank you, Morgan. <laughs> I will tell you, I've got very few little things here to mention. Oh, dear me. It's two days before Britain leaves the European Union. In January of 1977, it was the first time Britain held the presidency of the European Union, because we'd just joined, essentially. And, yeah, let's not talk about that, as it's depressing. More exciting is that the Ford Fiesta goes on sale in the UK in in January of 1977. Excellent. The first car I remember... My family having was a Ford Fiesta, an A Reg Ford Fiesta. Oh right, I know many of my friends. Mum had one. Good little car. Right. My next thing on the list is that in June of 1977, an American chap called Ray Sullivan became a seven-time strikey by lightning. He was struck oh. by lightning seven times. Yeah, was he like a park ranger? He or was. Something? Yeah. yeah. I suppose what, that's in a, a day. What in, no, what in, his, his, life, in his life? life. Yeah. In, oh right, his life, which rather tragically ended a few years later when he shot himself mm. due to unrequited love, apparently. And yet, it only took one strike of lightning to kill Dracula in the scars of, of Dracula. Dracula. Yeah, I know. So you know, what does that tell you about? Well, Dr- Dracula. Or he he can also ranges. be killed by a prickly bush, though, and I suspect Ray Sullivan would have s- survived many a prickly yeah. bush in his years as a park ranger. Oh, I think probably on day one of park ranger recruitment, the first question they ask you is, how would you feel about prickly bushes? And if you say, I'm not keen, question two is, are you a vampire? <laughs> yeah. They just lash uh, you in one yeah. and see yeah. how we get on. And if he didn't just, dissolve that, that, that and disappear. Your satanic rights. Yeah. <laughs> if he didn't dissolve... <laughs> then uh, you're in. I do hope some people start listening to this podcast for the first time and drop in at this point where yep. we're just talking about <laughs> vampires being broken by well, prickly bushes. So seven times in yeah. a lifetime. Yeah. yeah, Guinness World Record holder. I think also in June, this was interesting. The reason I wrote this down was, have you seen the film The Blues Brothers? Oh, indeed. indeed. And there's a scene in it with Illinois Nazis who they basically drive off a bridge and then they spend the rest of the film chasing them. I didn't realise Illinois Nazis were a real thing. Uh Organised, uniform wearing, marching. So basically the National Socialist Party of America took the village of Skokie, which is in Illinois, to the Supreme Court who ruled that they were allowed to, eventually they ruled in the favour of the the Nazis, basically say you can march through there because it's freedom of speech. And so... This guy who led them, who was a, excuse me, everyone, prick. <laughs> well, I suspect they were all pricks. Well, they yes. were Nazis. One would imagine so. Yeah. They decided to march through Chicago instead anyway. But I didn't realise that, that must have been in the air before they made the Blues Brothers, which was only in 1980. Yeah. Mm. Illinois, I hate Illinois Nazis. New York City blackout in July. Blacked out oh, yeah. for 25 hours and everyone went mad. Yeah. Did they? Yeah. Well, I've never heard about that. I'm trying to think whether there's any reference to it coming up in any McBain books, because it seems such an obvious thing, because, you know... Yeah. Like, there was looting and rioting. Was there? Yeah. 25 hours and everyone turned into animals, apparently. Oh, wow. You feel like that's got to crop up somewhere, hasn't it? Yeah. I've got... And there's two or three little music things as the year goes along. Elvis dies in mm, August 1977. Gosh. We don't need to go on about that. Everyone knows that. There's the Leonard Skinner plane crash. Oh, yeah. So that's quite dramatic. But Meat Rofe released his Battle of Hell. Well, indeed. Not all bad. Yeah. So at least we've got some overblown music about motorbikes <laughs> to appreciate. <laughs> and before we get on with the book, we have one question from our listeners. And this is from our friend Andrew at Much Ado About Nil on Twitter. And he. Asks us, if Evan was still alive, Evan Hunter was still alive, and we had the chance to interview him, say we all got told, right, for the podcast, you can go and interview him next week, and if he's still alive, obviously, what would be the questions we'd be dying to oh, ask? Oh, my goodness. It is tricky, isn't it? Oof. I think... I think we need to think about that. Ooh. Yeah. Well, ponder it, and we'll come back to it, yeah, okay? I think, I think so, yeah. Because definitely, you'd have to write some questions, wouldn't you? But uh, you wouldn't want to be asking the same ones that everyone always asks in all the interviews I mm. read with him. And that would be the problem, wouldn't it? Yeah. Try and catch him out. <laughs> anyway, on to the book. Long time no see. Who wants to give us a little pricey overview for every everyone? Shall I do it, Steve? Or well, plot wise, or yeah, give us a little wise, overview. Or all wise. 
plot wise? Well, I what got, happens I got, in this story? I, well, I got it off my uh, shelf the other day, and one noticed that it's a little thicker than most of the other entries in the series. So that was a bit my more substantial, aren't they? First point. impression was its thickness, and thus started reading. So it involves initially the slaying uh, of a blind, well, who's a beggar essentially, but a a, a, um, a pensioned off war veteran who's only quite a young man, isn't he? Thirty yeah. something like that. He's been in the uh, Vietnam War. Killed on the street. His dogs chloroformed, and then shortly after that. Um, well, the one thing we do know about his death is that the person who kills him uh, shouts, Where is it? Where is it? And then he kills him. And then shortly after, his wife, who is also blind, is murdered by somebody masquerading as a police detective mm-hmm. or police patrolman. Yeah. And their room is uh, ransacked. So there's some searching for some mysterious object. And then... Thus starts the investigation for quite a while, and then perhaps the uh, not too much happens after that whilst the investigation <laughs> is going on. It's just, well, and, it's true. It is and the, then there is the killing of, of a third one. blind person. Now, who's that? Now, I don't want to say that's somebody and nobody, but it's just a a, a, a fresh character to the scene that you don't really yeah. know much about and don't end up finding too much about. And then they basically sort it all out, and Bob's yeah. your uncle, and Bob's your uncle. everyone Fan- goes home. That's it, yeah. So yeah, because quite strangely, despite its thickness, the essential plot in terms of what happens and the crime itself is no more or less complicated than a standard entry. I would yeah, we've, say we've it, definitely seen dispense with plots like that in kind of half the length, yeah. really. But it's just he's just taking a bit more time to kind of stretch out and and enjoy himself with some of the bits and definitely. Yeah. And the one thing I found it's about fun. this it is maximum levels of descriptiveness, particularly about uh, the fictional city yes. and geography. Mm. I, I reckon you'd struggle to find another entry in the whole fifty-five books that describes the city. Uh, in as much detail as this book, it certainly does add to our knowledge of of the city quite a lot in 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 this one. I if, would agree. If you were getting a blank piece of paper out and trying to draw a map, I reckon you would this, do yeah. you could do worse than start with this one, yeah. uh, because there's absolutely loads of it all the way through. Also, I think that the, the, the inflated page count allows for a lot more. Of the entertaining um, asides from the narrator that I, I always really enjoy, and that yeah. there are lots of them here. It goes off on little diatribes, which I find very enjoyable. So that there's... well, one of the things that comes out of that, and I was going to say, did you spot loads of references to Britain? Yes, and yeah, England absolutely. particularly seems to be particularly playing on his mind, uh, and Liverpool even. <laughs> yeah, so I think that's what page thirty-nine or something like that. Liverpool, yeah. Gennaro came from Calm's Point, a part of the city that spoke American, the way the people in Liverpool spoke English. Oh, <laughs> I must have missed that. Is, is that where it's all, all discussing the, the fact that lower class people, including criminals, use the word turlet? Yes, basically. <laughs> I remember turlet. Yeah. Turlet. Sounds like from Lancashire. <laughs> well, yeah, Richard Gennaro from Lancashire. Um, Going to the turlet. Yeah, but there's about five or six points where he pointedly mm. says something about Britain. In yeah. fact, he refers to a, a couple of places, specifically in London. I think he may have just been picking sort of British-sounding street names. Mm. Did these sell better in Britain than America? Well, I have a theory Curiously. about this. I do have a theory about I this. Wonder. The year before, there was a big reissue campaign of, the, of earlier ones in paperback. Uh-huh. And he did a lot of press for that. And I think he might have been in the UK on a book tour during 1976 or thereabouts. Also, because I know that someone contacted us through social media once who gave us, said, I've got these photos of Evan Hunter on a book tour in Glasgow in the 70s. So I think when they did the reissues with the new things coming out as well, he went and he did loads of press and he did, he did a tour of bookshops in the UK. So I have a feeling he's come back and he's expressing some opinions <laughs> about <laughs> us in this book. 
partic- yeah, I'm, and I'm not going to say anything about his references to frigid British women, which are in here. <laughs> Make of that what you will. Yes. But, yeah, I think it must have been on his mind anyway. That's my theory. I need yeah, to confirm the date, but I've not been able to confirm exactly when he was on this. I remember him tour. commenting about decimalization and saying that's a step in the right direction. <laughs> well, he wasn't wrong. <laughs> so yeah, loads of British references in here, and a, and a dig at the speech patterns of Liverpoolians, <laughs> wow. which we live with every day. Yeah, as as fake scousers that we are. That's it. Yeah. So here we go. Then we've got a pile of dead blind people. Mm. We have. Is it just a psycho? Is is the setup basically? What do we think about the amount of dead ends in this? It's interesting, isn't it? That there's at least two, I think, big investigative bits that he goes down, try to figure something out. Corella basically mm. uh, turn into complete dead ends. The main one being when he discovers that the wife of the the murdered wife of the first murdered person has been having an affair with someone. He spends ages talking yeah. about that, investigating it. They have, yeah, they have the dead end with the veteran's mother's fella, don't they? And yeah. Like a lot, a lot about, r- about... Yeah, well, exactly, yeah. They just... Because, um, yeah, Corella f- flies solo in this book. Pretty, pretty may amazing it a, a bit, isn't times, he? Yeah. But yeah. Uh, it's essentially Corella, isn't it? And he, yeah, like you say, just clutching at some there, straws. Yeah. In, uh, a lot of frustrating dead ends. I think in terms of presenting a kind of um, plausible kind of account of a, a, an investigation, it's probably a good thing, really, rather than just sort of everything kind of slotting into place neatly like it sometimes does in, in, in a mystery novel. I think if, if, we're, if we're looking at police procedure, we probably want to see that, you know, that a lot of it is just slogging through these possibilities and having yeah. to just eliminate things rather than using brilliant deduction to almost supernaturally kind of pinpoint the perpetrator of the crime, which, you know, you can see in in some crime novels. Yeah, he doesn't sort of go, well, it was clear that this wasn't going anywhere, so Corella forgot about it. He <laughs> does play it through to the end, doesn't yeah, it, on, on all of these ones. Mm. The best thing is he discovers that eventually that the Isabel Harris, the murdered woman, the place she was working, stuffing envelopes with catalogues. He only finally gets there and discovers that the catalogues are for really disgusting sex toys. Hmm. Yeah, and the boss says, well, she couldn't see them. Yeah. <laughs> Novelties, I think, is the word. That Although you, as. you also get the, uh, well, not even impression, like the only hired her because he could pay her less. Uh, <laughs> it's funny, aren't some of her co-workers kind of like bizarrely prudish about some of the clothes that she wears as well and it's like if you're stuffing if you're working in a place that sells sort of marital aids you, you, surely you wouldn't be particularly prudish about well, advice on double well, standards maybe yeah, they, yeah, yeah they're, they're a funny bunch all that they, lot, they are they? really it's a, an odd odd little company uh, yeah so the, yeah there's the uh, the mother's fella and he's he's tra- training a boxer isn't he so there's yeah. a little bit about a little bit about that, and that's a, another dead end. Yeah, because um, there's always the talk about who's going to get the insurance, you know, the life insurance, and that's obviously going to go up to this guy's mother and things like that. Mm-hmm. But, but he's on to the essential solution reasonably early in this. It just takes a lot just, of time well, to work it. out, and I'm very impressed with the paperwork. And records that the uh, American military hold. Well, Although I suppose it wouldn't be that old. I mean, you know, ten years old. I suppose, aren't they? When, I, I guess so. Actually, in, in... Uh, but even so, yeah. Whether they are as easily accessible as, it's... I mean, he, he plays it as if all this stuff that he needs to get this backstory of this veteran. Oh. He plays it as if he's he's hamstrung by phone calls and procedure a little bit. But I wonder if it would ever be actually as easy as mm-hmm. that the military would go, oh, we'll help them, the police, and we'll send someone with an S, uh, you know, to take the papers down to the city or something like that. Yeah. Or whether it literally would be, it takes as long as it takes, and it's coming in the post, if you're getting it at all. Mm. But, you know, maybe that's where he has to make concessions for our sake as the reader. I so. Yeah. I did want to say one of my favourite things about this is there's a couple of references... There's a point where Corella and Maya Maya go to interview someone, Mrs. Harris, the mother of the murdered man. And it's like, Maya Maya was sitting there. He was a cop, a real cop. 
And Corella sitting there, he was a real cop. They were the basic the reference is he's not Columbo. Corella is not Columbo. Yeah. Oh, is that the Columbo <laughs> yeah. Kojak? Uh, yeah, Maya yeah. Maya isn't Kojak. <laughs> yeah, he wasn't wearing yeah, he says he wasn't wearing a dirty Mac or dressed like the mayor. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah which I thought was quite funny. <laughs> So Maya Maya's life has already been made a misery by the fact that Kojak's on television <laughs> and, and he's a bald cop. Yeah, I don't really watch Kojak much, but no. I did see a snippet of it on telly the other day and it looked actually quite good. Yeah, I've only watched literally a few minutes of Kojak. It's funny because it's such a big thing. Yeah, in, and he's in... quite good as well, isn't uh, he? Might give it a whirl. Yeah, yeah there has to be a reason why it's kind of that fondly remembered. And not just the novelty of him being mm. bald and sucking a lollipop. Yeah. Or isn't he giving up smoking or something? That's why he sucks a lollipop, so, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, I'm sure. yeah. But anyway, I've done more than my fair share of Columbo watching, so no one can accuse me of not uh, not watching 1970s cop dramas. Very true. Between that and Quincy. So I'm looking, I've got these all little blue tabs in here, so Maya Maya, he's fed up. Quite a lot of good Maya Maya backstory in here as well. He's got a really bad hangover at one point, hasn't he? Yes, because he's... Uh, Irwin he... the Vermin. Oh, he's calls. getting married, yeah. <laughs> Some good squad room scenes as well, and a lot of a lot of the squad room banter and the stuff surrounding it is because once the chloroformed seeing eye dog, oh, yeah. the, the the guide dog for the blind man, it comes round. Everyone's just trying to. It's like you can't leave this dog here. You can't. You can't leave it here. You can't leave it here. If you leave it here, it's going to be destroyed. And Corella's trying to constantly whilst investigating this case. <laughs> Constantly ringing round places. Like, Can you take him? Can you look after him? And everyone's like, for a bit, for a bit, for a bit. And so by the end of this book, Corella's got a dog. Yeah. The, uh, the, I seem to recall the guy from the dog section is particularly... Oh, he's an absolute... Pain. Yeah, <laughs> he's an absolute pain, isn't he? Just really nasty, <laughs> foul mouth, kind of impatient get. Yeah, yeah. You, you're going to call me first thing. It's like, it's only five past nine. I've been since eight. That's first thing. <laughs> We do get into a couple of different um, precincts as well in this one. We do. And there's a great bit where Corella's like, oh, has a call come from outside the precinct? Please don't let it be where Fat Ollie is. Please don't <laughs> let it be the 8-3. And it turns out to be the 8-5. But we also get the 41st precinct as well at some point. And it's like, oh, there's all these little stories going on somewhere else where you just get a little snippet of a character. And you just think, oh, I'd like to know about that. Yeah, one of them's <laughs> called yeah Cutler's Last Stand, is it, after the... The guy who's in charge of the precinct, and you think, oh, an entire another world of yeah. books could exist about that. Yeah, well, in fact, I have got... The seven this... Sevens known as being the lucky precinct, even though it's got the highest crime rate in the city. <laughs> all these little... Yeah, chapter 11 basically opens with a description of all the different sorts of precincts in and where they are in mm. the city as well, which, yeah. like you say, is a really good bit of description for the, yeah, the yeah. world building. Isola was divided into 23 precincts and five of those were up in Diamond Back and then he explains all of what they are, where they are. Yeah, when, have... they, when they say it's Isola's in t- into 23, Isola just being the island bit. Yeah. So the, the, the reason why there's... Obviously the numbers go into the hundreds is because that includes all the bits that aren't in Isola. I guess they, they, they start yeah. the, the lower numbers are out in the boroughs, are they, I assume? I think so. And if my... Yeah, Admittedly, just... limited knowledge of New York uh, precinct numbering is anything to go by. There would have been a lot more smaller precincts earlier on, which over the years would have merged, and so you don't actually have a consistent numbering. So mm. there wasn't there wasn't like a number one up to a hundred and first. Ah, okay. Well, even even in that, they say that they like skipped a number because they like like the eight three and the eight five and the eight seven mm. and the eight nine and then the one oh one or something. So. Yeah, I think it's it, it seems pretty reflective of what it actually yeah. is like in New York itself, which is quite good. So I like so it. How big are the precincts then? So would 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 like the eight seven be like the size of of what like Wavertree? Bigger, I probably think, a bit bigger. I think, think South, bit bigger, South Liverpool. It seems, it seems to en- encompass quite a lot when the. the yeah, well, the descriptions when you read them of, of the 87th Precinct is essentially, it's it's all of one side of Central Park, more or less. Mm. So it's going to be like... The, between Central Park be like, and the river. It's going to be yeah. like the size of our parliamentary constituencies then, isn't it? You know, like... Something like that, maybe, yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, there's definitely there's very specific descriptions of it, yeah. of what it is, which I don't have to hand at the moment. Yeah, they, but they, yeah, they, the they real world in, version to imagine is basically all of one side of Central Park to the yeah. river, more or less. Yep. Yeah. So another one of those dead ends is where Corella has to go to find the niece of one of the murdered women, and she turns who's told <laughs> who's told her uh, her auntie, this blind woman, that she's moved to Chicago and is actually just working in a strip, cl- uh, not a strip club. A massage a parlor. massage parlor, and we get get a little kind of um, a sort of description of how massage parlors manage to operate these uh, operations, kind of un- under the radar as well. Which is another sort of bit of uh, insight into the criminal underworld of, of Islo as well. Yeah, it seemed largely unnecessary all that though, because surely to God he would have just <laughs> waited for it to go home, wouldn't he? Yeah, I don't know. It don't just know. all seemed a bit odd that. You didn't want chapter. to see Corella in a towel? Yeah, well, yeah. Just all seemed a bit odd. <laughs> but it gives him an opportunity to do it. I think that's the main comedy character in there, isn't it? The guy mm. in the massage parlour who thinks his Corella's being a, you know, <laughs> skipping a turn or whatever yeah. it is with one of the girls. And he's like, Can I just have a word? Takes him aside. He's like a fat bloke called Arthur or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Arthur, that's him, yeah. So that's quite a nice little funny bit. <laughs> but what we really need to talk about here, and I think this is the main th- thing that stands out for me in this book, is essentially we have a lot to do with the army. Corella goes to do his research. He discovers that the first victim, James Harris, was blinded while he was in Vietnam. Since then, his treatment has involved a lot of sort of psychiatric work discussions of dreams psychoanalysis because he's been having these nightmares so he goes up to this this military hospital where he meets a very flirtatious person Mm -hmm. so we get Corella being teased with the opportunity to commit some extramarital affair which of course he doesn't being Corella but we get this transcript of a dream thing recorded on tape a really weird dream Mm -hmm. and then the book is full of loads of psychoanalysis or discussions of what could this dream mean? Uh, what uh, did it feel real to you? That stuff. I mean, it's interpretation mm. of dreams as one of your main plot solving. Points. Yeah, I found that completely ridiculous, to be honest. But the fact that it was even on record to start with, and the fact I just cannot believe for a minute that you would start looking for a solution to a murder ten years later on the basis of. Some really mad dream. About a Christmas tree. Yeah, and it, that all, that bit of it and the solution did all seem ultra-contrived, to be honest. And I love Gustav Millerman's book of dreams that tells you what every <laughs> dream's about. But, yeah, it did seem a bit daft, for want of a better word, all that, really. I mean, in fact, not daft in terms of that you can look into dreams because, of course, you can and come to solutions. But the fact that you'd even start there as a potential solution to uh, the uh, a crime, really, it's an, it is an interesting one. I mean, if if you're looking just because I guess he starts out by just looking for anything on him at all because they know very little. If if the one thing that does turn up when he's looking for any kind of shred about this guy's life is the report of this dream, and that's kind of all that's left to go on when you've chased down every other dead end. I suppose it does become quite significant, and you if you have to base an investigation on that when there's nothing else, then uh, that's how I viewed it in order to make it plausible to me. Yeah, I understand that, and like, but. <laughs> You sort of have you have two things. You have the actual playback and transcript of this guy talking about his nightmares, mm. which is about a gang. Essentially, leads him to some sort of revelation about a gang and a potential gang rape when mm. they were when he was young, which then Corella follows up, and then later we have Corella talking to a police psychologist, saying, "What do you make of all of this?" So he needs someone to help him interpret the interpretation mm. of the of the dreams. Which I think is tricky because essentially this is all based on Freudian analysis, yeah. which by 1977 was already, I think, considered to be largely bullshit. <laughs> um, Jungian analysis and all that sort of stuff. But I don't know enough about it no, as, a, I, as a topic, yes. other than I think by then, you know, dream, simple dream interpretation in the Freudian style was already a bit like, yeah, not sure. 
But he ends up getting there in the end by just essentially tracking down all his army buddies, mm. which he would have done without that dream. So it, it almost becomes slightly irrelevant. Yeah, And yet possibly. takes up a massive chunk of the book, really. It does. And I think that's one of the things that makes a book longer is the fact that he's gone into this that much level of detail about the back the green story. carpet and his mum having a penis when she lifts up a skirt or something. Is that in your book of dreams? <laughs> no. <laughs> Max, Maxi Miller, uh, Gustav Millerman doesn't make mention of that. <laughs> I think you should reread it and see if you can work it out. But I will say one thing. The... Um, the military background he decides to give Jimmy Harris, it was interesting. One of our friends on Twitter, Hank Wellman, mentioned that one of the good things about Jimmy Harris, even though he's a corpse, basically, in Chapter 1, mm. is he has a full life in the city, mm. and you get to experience that. Yeah. You have you see his time as a gang, you see his time as a kid, you see his time moving into into the army, and then you see the, the, out, the outcome of that once he gets back as a vet. Yeah. And you don't normally get to see that with these ancillary characters, no. which is an interesting thing. So yeah. that's, it makes him a very real victim. But his military background, checked because they're talking about Operation Alamoana. Mm. So I thought, is that a real one? Sounded pretty plausible to yep. me. And it was. 1966, 1967, Operation Alamoana was the code name for the combat operations of the 25th Infantry Division in December 1966, which was in areas near Saigon and in the Hobo Woods which began on December the 1st, 1966, which tallies in exactly with what yeah. McBain says in the book. And the point was the 25th Infantry Division, it was designed to keep the Viet Cong away from rice-producing areas. Oh. So that was the point of, of that military exercise, which is where this thing in the past, the blinding yes. incident for a kickoff, yeah. happens to Jimmy Harris and also the events that lead to a rather interesting denouement to Indeed. this book, which... Spoiler policy, no spoiler policy. <laughs> We're going to have to sort of talk about We're a little bit, aren't we, to wrap it up? It yeah. Tackle headlong. Yeah, I think, well, we need to go, we need to pile headlong into Major Tataglia's office. Yeah. Who took over once the platoon's leader was killed or was. Let's or try and get this right. He was killed in the action, I suppose, wasn't yeah. he? But there's a. <laughs> Corella plays a very TV detective y sort of trick here hmm. because another attempt is made on a blind person's life and another dog is supposed to be chloroformed but it doesn't work oh. and so we know that if this is the same attacker he's been bitten by the dog <laughs> which ultimately eventually comes around to Corella when someone you see Sam that, Grossman joins up the dots that that was another slightly unbelievable bit in that they'd go they'd send out the lab people in for to collect blood samples of a dog bite well, Even before they knew it was significant. Could have been rabies, though. Rabies is mentioned a lot in this. Mm. And let me tell you, let me tell everyone, oh. for the past four days at my work, I have spent I have spent it entirely making a presentation about rabies. Mm. I now know more about rabies, and I'm much more terrified about it Uh-oh. than I've ever been in my life. Oh, heck. And rabies keeps cropping up in long time, no see. And in fact, in guns, this is what I was going to mention... It also has loads of stuff about rabies Gosh. in at the end of it as this well. Is probably around this time, I don't know the date actually, but I'm guessing it might be around this time that Stephen King may have written Cujo, uh, a t- top rabies novel. Oh, um, <laughs> I th- think rabies must have been an issue of the day. Rabies, yeah. particularly. Fiction. Well, 99%, more than 99% of rabies transmission is done by dog bite. So, yeah. It's, it's no laughing matter. It certainly isn't. It's a horrible, horrible thing. If you have clinical symptoms of rabies, you are dead, essentially. I'm what, not going to talk. What are the symptoms? Well, do you really want to know? It's horrible. Rabies starts Just off... Just give me one. Well, I can give you one. Death. Starts off with like headaches, aching, then shaking, tremors, fever, hallucination, dangerous behaviour, including biting, because the disease is trying to get you to bite someone to pass it on. Crazy. And then eventually pa- paralysis, coma, and death. All right. So laugh a minute with rabies. That's Come basically on. all I've been doing for the past four days. Between that and the coronavirus, it's uh, terrifying. Yeah. I was a few years out with Cujo, 1981. 
Bye. Well, you know, it's not that in the grand scheme of things. <laughs> in geological terms, it's the same suppose. time. But I've forgotten how I got to babies now. <laughs> other than, yeah. But yeah, I was going to say, Corella plays a bit of a trick on on the, on basically the guy he's trying to catch, who's figured out has done it, who's playing by strict legal rules. Ah. Is basically saying, "Oh, that dog had rabies, <laughs> but it doesn't work. His gambit doesn't work anyway." You've not mentioned how they know it's him. The clue was there all along, wasn't it? If to be more thorough in their search initially, they'd have sussed it out uh-huh. straight away, wouldn't it? Yeah, because they find a key attached to the dog. So it's the looking... dog's collar, which they immediately work out is a safety deposit box in which is kept a. Um, a ransom letter. <laughs> oh, yeah, so it's um, blackmail. No. Because the other thing we should have mentioned is they have a big reunion, don't they? They oh, find out yes, a big reunion, ten year reunion with his old army buddies. After which his mother gets the impression that he's up to something, that he's got yeah. some get rich scheme. But it's all if buts and maybes really, and they yeah. don't really know anything. And Carilla quizzes all the army buddies, and then they end up finding the key on the dog when it comes back from the the dog squad. Um, dog squad! <laughs> and then there's a um, a letter to this fella saying, I know you killed me so-and-so, so and, so, and I want $1,000 every month. Thank you very much. Yeah. And so the solution is just revealed plain and simply. Simply. Yeah, it's true. That's basically what happens, although we haven't been too specific, so I'm sure you haven't ruined it for anyone who hasn't read it yet but we better start getting into summing up territory i will just say i didn't mention at the top of this what i normally mention is the publication history of this is that it initially came out in random house publications 1977 in hardback in america and then later in bantam edition in 1979 in the uk we're still Ham- hamish hamilton 1977 and pan 1979 and the dedication inside the book is this is for ronnie and lucille king about whom I could find nothing. Oh, so I did. I did search, and I normally can find a hint, but suddenly on this occasion I could not. Oh, poor old Ronnie and Lucille. Indeed. Well, they all know they are. <laughs> <laughs> so perhaps he made them up. Maybe he did. We need to sum up and give a grade for this. Really, a mm. a value in police shields using our patented. Kenneth System. Oof, now it's a while since uh, we've refreshed our memory of the uh, the Kenneth scores. Indeed. Yeah. So I will start talking and I'll hand Steve over the Kenneth score archive to... Are you, you going to score first then? I'll score first this time. Long Time No See. A very interesting novel, I think, in the whole history of the 87th Precinct because, as Steve pertained, right, pertained to right from the off... It's a thicker book, as Morgan pertained to. It's got the author's voice becoming very particular in a certain way. And it's not quite into the thriller territory, as I've mentioned in the past, Hmm. but we're getting there. We're definitely getting there. And I reckon the next few books are a transition between what you'd call strictly police procedural and what you would call a thriller. And I don't mean thriller in the Wilbur Smith Airport Hmm. book sense necessarily, but slightly more in that 80s mould of stuff anyway i like the story i find the psychoanalysis stuff tricky but psychoanalysis is more of an american preoccupation anyway and mcbain himself was seeing a psychoanalyst for years Hmm. that he'd thought didn't do him any good and eventually diagnosed him as being the guy with (laughs) the guy with writer's block in a period where he'd produced hundreds of books, loads of screenplays, <laughs> and this guy remembered him as, oh, the one with writer's block. <laughs> uh, so, there's, if anyone wants to listen, on the BBC iPlayer, you can still listen to In the Psychiatrist's Chair with Ed McBain, which is a very interesting listen, as much about what he doesn't talk about as, <laughs> as what he does, really. <laughs> so, I am going to simply sum up now, and I'm going to give this a rating... Of, it's good. It's definitely not one of my favourites, but it's very solid. So it's seventy-eight police shields for me. Okay, seventy-eight police shields from Paul to long time no see, and I'm going to open the floor to Morgan. Okay, well, there was an, another one which I was reading for the first time. Oh, excellent! Well, um, this will be interesting then. Yeah, 
Um, to be honest, I, I thought it was an absolute corker. Brilliant. Uh, really, really enjoyed it. I, I do take your point about the psychoanalysis stuff on board, any of the slightly less plausible bits, but I kind of don't care. I, 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 was, <laughs> I was really, really enjoying it. I quite liked the, the slightly more leisurely pacing of it than some of them. Yeah. I liked that it, you could hear that kind of endearingly kind of cranky narrator's voice coming in, which I, I always really enjoy in these books. Mm-hmm. Quite a, a lot of room for sort of interesting characters and just sort of, yeah, the discourses about the the, the city. I, I just I just love that. It's got a lot of things that I most enjoy in these books in. So I, I, for me, it was a an enthusiastic two thumbs up and a very healthy 86 police shields. Nice. Oof, oof. And now, Mr. Stephen Royston, who's going to return my pad to me because he's, he's... I don't know what he's doing on it. He might be hacking. <laughs> um, yeah, well, I suppose I've summed it up in my pre... Yeah, no, I very much enjoyed it and has a lot going for it in terms of its uh, detailed... Uh, you get a good flavour and picture of the city in this. The slight downside is the plot is a little daft. Well, not the plot, but the... The solution, maybe. Hmm. Uh, but, yes, still very enjoyable. Uh, and I will go about 74 police shields. Okay. And that gives us a result with our patented rounding down system of <laughs> 79 police shields. 79. Oh, yeah, yeah, Pretty okay. solid, that. Yeah, 8 out of 10, just about. And on the subject of how it was received, I've got a few reviews of this book Oof. that I've managed to find. So, for instance... The Kirkus, which is a this a publisher reviewing thing uh. at the time, so fourth of May nineteen seventy seven, was pretty keen on it. That was it. Let me just get the good phrase. McBain again paces the jog trot of police work into a mesmerising, affecting drama the where what? nothing seems staged for effect. The job trot. The job trot. Jog trot. Jog trot. Jog trot. What the I think hell it basically does... means the, the the footwork, the slog. Yeah. Of it, I, I have you. never heard of that. Word no, I neither have. But to counter that, we have Newgate Calendar. Of course, we do. Which I'm not going to give give no, you the opportunity no, no. to do the Newgate Calendar in the Newgate in the Newgate Times, <laughs> Newgate Calendar in the New York Times, 12th of June, 1977. There are procedurals and procedurals. By now, the 87th Precinct stories of Ed McBain have sold millions upon millions. The publishers cite an incredible figure: over 250 million copies worldwide. <sighs> <laughs> The idea is intriguing. The writing is wretched. McBain has the instincts of a good storyteller, but his literary style can be arch cutesy and full of pseudo-philosophical or pseudo-sociological asides that have all the intellectual strength of the late Arthur Brisbane. I don't know who Arthur Brisbane is. I should have researched that, really. It basically says, still, McBain must have something to attract so sizable a following. You figure it out. I, I can't. Ooh, ooh, he gets my goat. Um, he just—he just, really hates him. I've, I've forgotten what his real name is, but he's—he's—he he's he was also—he was mainly a music critic, wasn't he? And I think he was also well known for all just slagging off Leonard Bernstein for some reason too. Who's that? The, the, the Newgate Calendar in his in his real life persona. Oh right. Um, it, it's just just a can't do it. Can't do himself. So he just sneers at everyone else. What yeah. a rotter. <laughs> the Observer, Maurice Richardson, their crime reviewer. Duh, 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 duh. A welcome comeback to documentary doom laden big city form by Ed McBee, who has been getting rather costive, which is a good word. Mm. The Times, 29th of July. Now it's, he's getting reviewed in The Times, you know, which basically says it's good. Yeah, essentially. It basically praises the how real it feels when you read these books. And The Listener, I don't know what The Listener was, it's some sort of paper, but it had a book review section. The new McBain is something of a disappointment. Aww. McBain's getting too socially conscious for the job. I think he was always socially conscious. Yeah. I, I think that's that's a definite feature of the books. He's, it seems odd to comment on that at this stage. Yeah. So before we close, what questions would we ask Evan Hunter if we went and saw him tomorrow? Still don't know. Why are you so mean to Bert Kling? I think he got asked that quite a <laughs> lot. I think that is, that is one. I think I would want to press him on on how much of the real world is in this book. How much of you is Corella? Because he always sort of says, uh, a little bit. Or he says, no, I don't take my plots from real world inspirations. I'd like to sort of 
to say. He, he definitely does yeah. sometimes. You can just totally spot some of them, can't Cur- you? Curl is the guy he wants to be and he isn't. Yeah, I think that's definitely true. Mm. I suspect. And I think well, I'd want... I want to ask him God. what he's got with uh, this obsession with blind blind people, blind. deaf people. People with, yeah. Because so, uh, it runs through so many of these books. So people who've got some sort of uh, some sort of physical impairment yeah. to hearing or sight or, or whatever. Yeah, I guess you, you do get more people with impairments crossing up than in many of The, well. the uh, you know, like the angelic wife and the Moriarty villain, both deaf. Yeah. It's quite curious, that. Yeah, it'd be worth that would be worth checking in on him. I would definitely want I definitely want to press him more on his feelings about Hill Street Blues. <laughs> see if I could actually talk him round to admitting that it's not really <laughs> what yeah. he thinks it is. It'd be nice to know why he was so upset about that and not about apparently, as far as you can gather, about Barney, Barney Miller. Miller. Yeah. That would be a good one. We'd ask him yeah. about Barney Miller. Definitely. Yeah, because did you say you haven't found him commenting no, on that? I can't at find all. anything about him referring it's to that. Odd, doesn't it? I'd also like to know his feelings on Newgate Calendar because I feel like he he deserves the right to reply, frankly. Yes, I think that would be it. I think the opening gambit would be, so New York Times critic Newgate Calendar and then you just watch his head blow up. (laughs) I suspect he wouldn't have many kind words for him. One would imagine. I'd ask him who Ronnie and uh, Lucille King were. Fair enough. (laughs) You get the impression that uh, he didn't really kind of like take criticism particularly kindly anyway no i think he was quick to anger (laughs) yeah in fact i know he was because people have told me face to face so there you go (laughs) (laughs) there would be lots to ask him there'd be so much you'd want to ask him that's that then long time no see join us for our bonus episode where we will discuss as always the book covers particularly and especially some more stuff about what was going on in 1977 Until that comes out, we're going to say goodbye. So I'll say goodbye. Goodbye. Fairly well.